What if you could think about your own story in the context of your legacy? The pleasure of introducing you to Ben Feller this lovely morning on the Designing Your Legacy podcast. He is an award-winning writer who covered two presidents and now helps people and organizations tell their own stories. Welcome, Ben. Hi, so nice to be with you. Thanks for having me. It is my pleasure. So let's start out with a little bit of your background and how you arrived today at the firm where you're working. Sure. So I tend to think of challenges in life in terms of stories. So my story has two chapters. The first one was as a journalist for 20 years. I covered uh, all kinds of news, local, state, and national news. I I served uh, two terms, if you will, as a White House correspondent, both covering President George W. Bush and President Obama. And then my second chapter is one of business. I spend my time helping companies and organizations figure out how to better tell their own story. And I do that at a firm called Ms. Lansky and Partners. Yes, yes. And just a plug real quick, you are a fellow Nittany Lion. Absolutely. We are Penn State. Thanks for bringing that in. You didn't think I was going to? <laughs> <laughs> okay, wonderful. So in prior podcasts and interviews, you mentioned your time in journalism had all sorts of audiences. So I thought maybe we would start there regarding your background, your knowledge to bring forward to provide the listener with why understanding our stories, distilling our stories, and then sharing our stories matter, because designing a legacy is more than the financial and the legal documents. Yes, estate planning matters. That's an important first step. But what we think about when we think about loved ones and ancestry and family and friends or who become our family, whether that's caretakers or, again, our friends uh, in our adult life and so forth, I think that stories really matter. So how did you structure a question, let's say, to change or sway a narrative because again i mean that's like the big leagues so would you share kind of a few thoughts about how how you approach a story yeah i think for your audience the two two ideas come to mind two principles the first is when you talk about audience to start everything you're doing from the audience mindset and angelina that's such a um seems like such an intuitive thing to do but it's really not because most of us tell a story from our perspective. Here's what happened to me. Here's what I want to say. If you think about the way that you're communicating from what your audiences need to hear, it makes you stop and really think. And so it applies to legacy work. It applies to financial work. It applies to all kinds of sectors where we're telling a story that we need to be sure reaches our audience. And uh, we think about things differently. And, And that leads to the second point, which is how do you frame the right questions. Um, This certainly my work as a journalist informs the work I do as a communication advisor because everything that we work on starts with defining success. Before you begin a project, what is your definition of success? And that's the question that we start with. So I wouldn't really frame questions to sway a narrative. I would frame questions to figure out what the narrative is. And for, for my time as a political journalist, My framing was to get the president of the United States who had an interest in not making news to make news by thinking about what is he likely to say. And my audience was not the White House press corps or even my editors. My audience was the American public. What do they need to know to advance the story? So that's how I would approach it. Yeah. Well, I think that, dare I say, the drama that you experience and had to face at the White House is similar to oftentimes the drama that generations can face. I mean, whether it's a family business or just um, real life. And so I'm going to pivot for a moment to the fact that you had the opportunity to take trips to war zones, whether it was covering um, a variety of stories. And I know in a moment, you're going to explain that not every problem is a level 10 problem, but you were kind of flying in the the cloak of the night. Yeah, those are the most dramatic stories, and and they had a profound effect on me and how I think about life, because on the one hand, I was working. I was covering the President of the United States, and we were in the cloak of darkness. I did two trips to Afghanistan, where the world found out what was happening, and the President uh, flying into the most dangerous place in the world for him, by my coverage and those of my peers. Um, But at the same time, you know, I was also on those planes as a, as a, person and as a father. And so you felt uh, the weight of it and the safety risks of it uh, as much as anything, than you, as, much as, as much as you would for any other person. You know, the challenge was to toggle between, 
I've got to be safe. I've got to be careful. I'm thinking about my family. I'm thinking about getting home to I'm on the job. And what matters is keeping my focus in those moments. And usually it was a combination of those two. I would zoom out of um, uh, kind of like the human mode and go into work mode until we were on our way back. I'm like, OK, I'm looking forward to being back in the United States and safe and not have guns aimed at uh, aimed at the plane. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. And, and I'm going to pivot uh, in, in a moment to where you're at today and how it connects to legacy. But I just want to stay here for a moment. So you were in the cloak of darkness in a plane to not be shot down, pitch dark in the back of the plane. And if there was a leak that was out and you didn't want the president to be upset. And, and I just thought, you know, that it's just it's it's a bit of pressure because I think you had said that there can be a question and it couldn't be too narrow or too broad. And you also had to understand what the parties on the other side of the table were thinking and what they needed to know. And I just think that is some really good uh, emotional intelligence or context regarding, uh, again, that pressure to ask those vulnerable questions, but at the same time, being in an environment of uncertainty. Yeah, because you're, you're juggling so many factors there. And I think this applies to uh, people as they shape their own legacies or businesses that are in the business of helping people shape their legacies is you go into a conversation or a day with one objective in mind. And then as the day unfolds, you've got all these other competing factors. And so I might go into a press conference with the president thinking about what I wanted to ask, but then he makes an opening statement and then somebody else asks a question and then there's a news bulletin on a different topic. And so what's the right moment to ask what and how are you reading the room? Plus, people look at those moments as if they are um, press corps and administration. And really the way they need to think about it is person to person. That's when the job got most interesting is when the whole world faded away and it was the president of the United States saying, okay, we're going to take a couple of questions. Let's start with Ben, AP. And there was about a half a second gap before I asked something. But in my mind, it felt like 10 minutes because take a breath. What do you want to ask? And keep eye contact. This is a conversation. Because as he starts to answer, I might know, okay, he just made news. If he didn't answer the question, as the President of the United States is talking, and I have to think about exactly the right moment to interrupt him to say, I'd like to take it back to my question. That, obviously, the stakes of that are different than how most people kind of live their daily life. But the same lesson applies. Is What are you asking? How are you reading the room? And are you listening? Are you really listening and paying attention to what's happening in that moment? That's how you get deeper and deeper in the conversation and you find the answers about what people's stories are and what their legacy can be. Yes, absolutely. And I think it also takes a certain level of courage. Yeah, I mean, the courage grows as you have experience. That's what I counsel younger journalists and younger people in the field that I'm in where we're helping clients tell their story is you don't just wake up one day and decide if you're sitting in the room with the CEO and she's frustrated with her team because they can't do something or she's frustrated with uh, business or with us, how do you manage that situation, right? How do, you, how do you tell somebody who's in a position of authority what they need to do? Um, it, and it does take courage, but I think really courage comes from trusting your instincts, listening, learning, and just getting repetitions and then, uh, and then owning the moment. Because you know what? When people, even the most powerful people, when they're stuck, they want people that they can trust to just advise them, not cater to them. And that's really where the courage comes in. Yes, yes. Honest people, that can be more than yes people. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I know the firm where you're at right now responds to crisis as well as reputation, but I want to stay in this political sphere just for another moment. I thought it sure. was so interesting that uh, George W. Bush on the weekends watched baseball and he was early to the White House, whereas Barack Obama worked late into the night. I thought those human characteristics were very interesting. Oh, yeah. I mean, again, what people see of the White House is usually the trappings, the White House, the gate, the plane, the, the stage grab. Inside the White House, you get to actually know people as people. Now, of course, the press corps was always arm's length from the president. But if you spend time there inside the building, my office was inside the West Wing for, for six years. We had a little booth behind the briefing room that people see on TV. Over time, you get to see personalities. President Bush liked to give nicknames. He always, wear, uh, always wore a coat in the office. He was much more um, conservative about sort of how he treated the job and very disciplined. President Obama uh, had later evenings, he would go downstairs and he had two young daughters at the time and he would have dinner with them and then go back to work. They both worked hard, but they brought their own personality into the job. And that's what you saw over time. You know, people see it when they're campaigning 
because they're supposed to be having fun and getting people excited. But in governing, they brought their personality into the job too. And, uh, and but both, both those presidents, it's very disciplined. And that was something that I, you know, I really took notice of. Yes. Well, leadership, I think they would have to be disciplined. It's gosh, under being underneath the microscope and the world is watching. <laughs> that is a bit yeah. of pressure. <laughs> Since this is a legacy podcast, there was an interview you did with former President Obama where he spoke of legacy as securing a legacy for a country that's on the rebound. And that's in the context of that window of his term. And we chatted about this legacy topic a bit before today. So I'm curious, what does the word legacy mean to you and what one can design for their lives and families? You know, we deal in the business of language and how the right language can make audiences really hear you care about what you're saying and then make decisions because of it. And so we get into the meaning of words a lot. And this one has come up a lot because legacy can mean instinctively what happens when I'm gone, right? The first thing you think of is I'm not here anymore, so I need to do things now to get ready for later for other people. And legacy can also mean how you live your life right now. Like, what is the legacy I'm living in real life, in real terms? And I think both meanings are really important. The way I talk about it with folks is, what is the story of you? Like, how are you defining your life? Not just what do you wanna be known for when you're gone, but what do you wanna be known for now? And how are you living your life that way? How are you making decisions around that? And I think it's really empowering and, and fun, but a lot of people think about legacy as a ominous topic that they have to figure yeah. out before it's too late. And, and it can really be something that is about your life and the decisions you're making. And yes, after you're gone, how do you want to be remembered? And how do you set people up for success? How do you start other people on a deeper pursuit of happiness? Because you've spent time thinking about it. When you frame it that way, it creates all kinds of emotions, I think. Happiness, excitement, inspiration, possibility. It's not as dutiful as it is opportunistic. That's how I, I like to think about the word legacy. Yes, yes. Well, I think it uh, opens up the door and people's emotions can come forth. And it's not just this stiff, like, oh, I don't want to talk about legacy. Because again, like you had said, once the concept of happiness, the value of happiness gets incorporated into the conversation, oh, people have some things to say. And once the door they is opened a little bit, say. yeah, yeah. So, And also, I just wanted to add something really quick on this, Angelina. You asked earlier about framing questions. A lot of times, legacy conversations begin with people's goals. So how do you achieve those goals? And what can we do to achieve those goals? And who can help me do that? But what we find in our work is sometimes the people who are trying to craft their legacy don't know what their goals are. They need somebody to help them figure out the answer. And how do you do that? Because you need the person on the other end of the conversation to be asking the right questions without judgment or condescension and then listening to your answers. And once you find somebody who will help you do that, you just see people, you know, just kind of like lighten up a little bit. Like, okay, you're on my side. You know, I don't know what I need, but you're going to help me get there. Yes. Well, I think it's interesting uh, in uh, school, whether it's before university, after university, I think that there's a curriculum, there's a framework in place. And then in adult life, when that framework disappears, that structure, sometimes people yeah. don't know how to take personal agency. I, I oftentimes repeat that the five closest people we surround ourselves with matter because we need direction. And sometimes, again, we don't know in different stages of our life. And we need that honest feedback and those right questions. And even sometimes the wrong questions that can lead to the right questions, but at least the curiosity to start asking. So mm -hmm. you're from today and how, at Mil Milaski and Partners? Ms. Lansky and Partners. Thank you. Thank you. Has talked about the magnitude of when it's not right, or rather, um, the, the magnitude of, let's say, not doing something right. So I wondered, in terms of the stakes, what happens if somebody doesn't design their legacy or they, they don't even design it right when they could have brought their values forward? Well, first of all, both you and I are in the profession and we're positive people and optimistic people. So we think about these challenges and how do you get it right? But your question is also really important and timely because the wrong decision or no decision in action can also be really, really dangerous for folks. And when I say dangerous, I mean, if you don't think about asking the right questions, setting time to think this through, these are tricky issues. They're emotional issues as well as rational issues. And then lining up the decisions for you and for your loved ones. 
um, you can create all kinds of both stress in the meantime because you feel that clock ticking that you're not on top of something. And then uh, you can let um, really circumstances drive your decisions as opposed to you driving your circumstances. That's really the danger, right? You're not thinking about um, timing. You're not thinking about taxes. You're not thinking about communication between you and your loved ones. Who's in charge of what? How are they going to interact with each other? The more time you spend on those things, you'll find you're making smart decisions, planning your decisions, and pulling people in. And I've dealt with this in my own life. You know, sometimes I've, I've inherited a decision or a pending decision. I'm like, why did you, why did you think that was the right way to go? Well, somebody told me that, why don't you just ask me? Oh, well, how would you do it differently? Well, now we're having a conversation. So I really think that there's so many ways it could go wrong if poor communication happens on the front end. And, you know, the manifestations of that are all over the place. People get their feelings hurt. They're, they're, they're not informed. They have, they all of a sudden they inherit property, tax bills, decisions, care for loved ones. Why weren't these things talked about on the front end? That's really the risk if you don't ask the right questions and pull in your audiences early. And again, I think the reason why people don't do it is not because they're not thinking about these things. Everybody thinks about their mortality at some point. It's that these are not topics that people want to take on. So if the easiest thing to do in life is nothing, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it next year. That gets risky. That, and I think, who do they talk to about it? Because if I were to go down to the local coffee shop, the Starbucks, the coffee bean, this isn't new sports and weather. Yeah. So I think it's, it's again, finding people that, that are open to talking about and finding a way forward. And I think society is changing. I think one of the things I mentioned in our preamble is today, compared to a decade ago, people are more conscious about this idea of legacy given recent events and just an awareness of the glue that holds society together and communities, mm -hmm. communities together. Yes. And I know one of the things you have said is when you make it smaller, you make it more relevant. Yeah. I mean, think about this topic. You and I deal with these things every day. So we start our conversations at a more comfortable place than folks who wouldn't. This is this can be really daunting, not at an intellectual level. A lot of people can grasp this if they understand the choices of a legacy, and what they need to do. But it's daunting to sort of know where to start define my legacy. What the hell are you talking about? How do I do that? And so one way I find to take challenging issues is to make them smaller. Let's have one conversation to start. Let's make the definition of success I talked about earlier one thing. Let's figure out what would make you feel a little bit more at ease. What would begin to make you feel more prepared? What are the things that are keeping you up at night? And that's an expression people use, but this one actually keeps people up at night. They wake up and like, oh my gosh, I have to, I have to do something about that. Uh, you know, and so Making it smaller makes it manageable. It leads to um, conversations that people feel they can just own. And, you know, this is the focus of my- possible. Sorry to interrupt. Become possible, yeah. I mean, I wrote a children's book on this topic because my, when my son was very young and he would get overwhelmed by daily life, the instinct as a parent, at least of this parent, was to say, I'll do it. Don't get frustrated. I'll do it. And what he really needed was somebody to help him understand how to do it. So I physically got smaller. I got down on one knee and I slowed the moment, made the moment smaller by having some deep breaths. And then we did it together. And then before he went about his day, we did a little small moment together of celebration. You did it. And we did a handshake over and over and over again to the point when I got stuck in traffic and I just absolutely was overtired and got frustrated and lost my cool. My son from his car seat looked at me in the rear of a mirror and said, Daddy, don't get frustrated. Big problem or little problem? Because that's what we talked about. Big problem or little problem. And so that's the title of the book. And a lot of parents who have read it said, I need to take this into my conversations with my partner and my spouse because we're not making big problems into little problems. We're treating them all as big problems. The dishwasher is broken. It's the same problem as we don't have, a, we don't have our will updated. <laughs> They're not all big problems. You got to make them smaller. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad that you brought up that point because I think oftentimes people get overwhelmed and it's, it's, I think the point about the how question is, is the best question because there is a way forward. And I think when people get overwhelmed at any age to be able to meet them at that eye level and to say to them, it's not the end of the world. It's not like a plus or failure. 
we can just take a deep breath. And, yeah. and so when I think about the, the pressure that even some of the, the next gen is under, whether it's succession or stepping into executive roles or trying to find their way forward into today's changing digital economy, it's sometimes just take a deep breath, find some people that can help you through it. And so it's just not all on your shoulders of like, yeah, yeah. It's, it's such a big, it's such a big part of this, I think. And, you know, sometimes what happens is people think that they have to make what I consider to be a false choice. I need somebody who's empathetic, who can slow down the world and reassure me that this is doable. Or I need somebody who has the actual technical ability to walk me through the financial choices, but you can't get both in the same person. And that's clearly not true. You need somebody who can understand what you're going through and, and connect at a human level, but then also say, all right, now we're past the point of kind of reassurance. Let's actually take this on and walk you through the steps. And if you could do both, both in the field of legacy creation, language creation, business, politics, you're so far ahead of the game. Yes, yes. And I'm going to ask you about your legacy in a moment, but I know one of the areas that you were aware of was helping children with anxiety as maybe one of the motivations of writing your children's book. Yeah, I mean, as a that story I just told, when I was stuck in traffic and my son helped me through it by showing me he had been hearing my lessons and living my lessons, I thought two things. First of all, how amazing is it when you get that affirmation in life that the work that you're doing is actually making a difference? You got the lesson. And then secondly, as a writer, I just thought in that moment, sitting in the car, this there's a story here that could help other people. You know, I, I didn't want it to just be touching and cute. I wanted it to be, okay, well, how do you make life less frustrating for kids and parents? Who couldn't use that? And so that was really what energized me to tell the story. And I think, you know, children anxiety, I'm not a psychologist uh, or a therapist by trade, but I spent a lot of time breaking down situations into things that are more manageable for people. And I just think we lose sight of the fact as adults that kids don't speak our language. They just don't. Part of the book is three words, frustration, patience, perspective. Well, how many four-year-olds know what those mean? But we use them. You just need to have some more patience. Or somebody loses the cape they want to use for superhero day and they can't find them. Like, just you got to have some perspective. Well, they don't know what you mean. And so not, you're just talking past them. And so I thought that the book could be helpful in helping other parents just get a little bit of perspective themselves, be mindful of the language you're using and slow it down a little bit. And of course, perspective for parents too, that we need to be a little bit uh, mindful of our own pace and self-importance and just get back to being present. And nobody can take that advice more than me. <laughs> well, I think it's interesting you modeled it. So it also became more real that moment. Yeah, I had no idea how much I was modeling it. Again, it all looks linear now in retrospect. Isn't that funny how life works? That makes it seem like it was a plan. I was just doing what worked. It was trial and error on problem solving. That's what we do, whether you, you know, you're a parent or just any kind of grown up. You problem solve your way through life. The modeling from a boy to his daddy made all the difference in the world. Yes, yes. Well, modeling makes it real. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It did make it real. And when um, he modeled it back to me, that sure made it real. <laughs> <laughs> he was paying attention. <laughs> he was paying attention. He was paying, yeah. I wish my language would have been a little cleaner when I had that meltdown because he does listen. But otherwise, I did okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think uh, I just want to bring up uh, two other key points before I, I ask you about your personal legacy, which is that uh, you have said it's not what you say, it's what they hear. And people respond to language emotionally, not rationally. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, the, even this conversation is a mix of both, you know, the, the thinking through the steps that people should take. So when I uh, advise clients or teach writing, walk through the steps of defining success, having an audience mindset, making sure that you speak in plain spoken terms, not jargon, making sure that there's a sense of brevity to it because people are busy and you want to convey action. All these things make sense and they're practical tips. But the way that people hear stories and live life is emotional. You know, think about the the books and the movies and the songs over the last, let's just say, six months. Somebody says, you seen anything good recently? You know, you don't talk about it rationally. Like, I'm going to walk you sequentially through the last six things that you think, like, oh, my gosh, have you seen this show? Or I just saw a concert 
a, a piano concert and I'm still feeling it. And look what I did. I touched my chest. Like you touched your react. heart. You touched you. Yeah. You, you think about what touched you. And so when you're thinking about communicating to audiences, why do people say, okay, good morning. We're going to talk today. And you think about your script and your PowerPoint. Well, part of it is because they're nervous and it's public speaking, but part of it is you just forget that the same people you're talking to in that audience are also the same people you you talk to in on the subway or the ride home but one on one about your day but you don't script those you're just talking like it's a conversation so what we do is we try to remind people every conversation is personal absolutely every conversation is personal so don't overlook the emotion of it and if your topic like legacy is emotional or sensitive don't go around it honor it this is hard but we're going to make it a little easier oh my gosh thank you you just gave me permission to feel. That's what people need. They need permission to feel. It doesn't mean you're not going to get into the practicality, but allow me to have a personal moment with you. And now we're just talking at a different level. Yes. So speaking about legacies being personal, what does the word legacy mean to you? And or who were any of your positive role models growing up? Yeah, you know, I, I really think about legacy as making life happier. So if I'm going to uh, talk to you about legacy needs to be in the present tense and not just in the past tense, when I say talking about making life happier, I mean now and later. So I feel like when I talk to my son about big problems, little problems, and it turns into a life lesson, it turns into a book that he's now on the cover of, and he's going to take it to hopefully his kids one day. That's all in the real time. And, and it's not like I've conquered that. We still talk about it at home. Because he'll come over to me and give me a hug and say, take three deep breaths. So we're living the legacy of making life happier in real time. And then thinking about, okay, how am I setting him up and others in my circle of loved ones for a better life later? And you know what, Angelina, I'm having these conversations myself with people who are in your profession. And they're not always very fun. They can feel arduous and they can feel weighty. And then you get into them and you think, why am I doing this now? Well, because when the moment happens, when I'm not here, how am I making their life better right then, that day, the next week, the next month? And when I start taking on those questions, I feel relieved because I'm actually working on a legacy that's going to make their life happier. That's how I think about it. Um, because I think the pursuit of happiness, we've, we've just lost it somehow. We pursue a lot of things, but I've written about the pursuit of happiness because I feel like we've forgotten that it's not entitled to us. You have to chase it. You have to work at it. You have to pursue it. That's yeah. what we were entitled to. You got to go find it. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Happiness is, is kind of an inside job, but we don't really always have the manual. No, don't have the manual. Don't yeah. have the manual. And so, you know, I, I was covering a story once about the demise of civics education. And I, I always think about the story because I talked to the member of Congress who was trying to push a law to improve civics education. I said, why is this so important to you in particular? He said, well, I just went to an AP history class back in my district and I was uh, listening to the conversation. And I asked people in this class, uh, what are the rights that we are entitled to? Our unalienable rights. And nobody said a word. And he's like, okay, well, I'll, I'll give you one to start. Life, you know, and he was liberty. trying to lead him to liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And finally, one kid raised his hand. He's like, oh, my gosh, thank God. The like, yes. And the kid goes, death? He's like, no, no, not death. Liberty and the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> and, said, and so, I, you know, I think about that story. Like, we've just lost sight of what we need to do to pursue our own happiness sometimes. And conversations like this can pull people out of the daily and say, well, yeah, what, what am I doing? That's usually what happens, right? It's some kind of life event. You take stock. What if you took stock in a little way every week? Absolutely. I think that when there is an, what they call an inciting event, that all of the this inner work matters and these intangible conversations matter. I think I also mentioned in our preamble about a podcast that talked about the estates of celebrities like Tom Petty or Robin Williams, et cetera. And a lot of times when there is the litigation afterwards, it's not necessarily over the millions. It's over the baseball cap and the bicycle of Robin yeah. Williams, et cetera. But nobody stopped to take note of those conversations. And amazing as attorneys are in the four corners of a document, they don't sometimes have 
the coaching or the emotional training to, to go in to uh, their client or to a family or who is sitting across the table from them and ask those touchy feely questions to be able to unpack what else needs to be talked about so there isn't that anxiety and emotional, you know, just whew, after someone's passing. It's it's let's figure it out now and and talk about it now so we can understand what makes everybody happy and to carry that forward so people don't get lost in society and they don't fall through the cracks. Totally agree. And that's why earlier I raised this idea of you don't it shouldn't be a um it's a false construct to think you should get somebody who understands the choices that you need to make and walk you through them and also be empathetic and be on your side. But to your point, I think a lot of people do find that choice. They're like, well I've got a lawyer an estate lawyer who's probably good at, at the functional questions. But if I find this really tough about which of my kids gets my baseball cap, they're going to say, well, fill out that answer on the third page of form B and let me know. I'm like, no, no, no. What I'm saying is I don't know what to do. Well, yeah. What are you asking me for? We're like, well, are you helping me with my legacy or are you helping me with my forms? Because I can find a lot of people who can do the second thing. I'm looking for somebody to help me make good decisions. And that means all of it. And I think that's just a smaller circle of people and professionals who are both willing to go there and, to your point, have the skills to go there. Yes, yes. And I want to bring up one other point before I ask you the next question, which is I think it's great that uh, in terms of uh, the children's book, but also the real life modeling of father and son helping each other through struggles. I think like if I were to hone in on one thing, I think that is part of, part of the legacy you're going to pass on. I hope so. I really feel it. And, you know, the, the reaction of the book has been uh, really affirming. Um, one of the things that surprised me a little bit is the fact that the entire story is about a father and son and that the modeling of a father to take the time to empathize and teach son about patience and perspective and do those moments. Um, you know, to me, that's not a uh, gender specific trait. That's not a mother's job or a father's job. Um, that's a parent's job. And but some people saw it as particularly surprising because it was a father who was doing it because their their fathers didn't do that. And so I'm really proud of that modeling because my son from his mother and his father gets modeled patience and perspective and problem solving. But it's always been something that's natural to me and I take seriously. And I, and I really think that when my son talks about this, the legacy will be that, yeah, my dad, my dad did this with me and for me. That would be a great legacy. Yes. I think it, it is miraculous and more fathers need to step up and be willing to get on their eye level with their children. So I'm curious, what's left for you to do? Oh, there's so much. You know, I, I was invited back to uh, Penn State, and I told you I'd work in Penn State a few years ago as a really proud moment for me as a distinguished alumni for my career. And I heard the speeches of the other folks, uh, you know, who were being honored that night, and they were pretty much what you would expect. And when I got up there, I'm like, listen, I, my point was Penn State has been there through my entire journey. I grew up in State College. I went to school. I changed paths. Um, I came back to speak, and now I'm being honored as a distinguished alum. But I'm still figuring it out. I don't stand here on the stage as somebody who's an distinguished alum and having accomplished. I'm like, there are questions that, that come up all the time. And in fact, since that point, I did a lot of growth and had a lot of reckoning during the pandemic, and I changed uh, positions. Um, which is always a daunting thing to do later in your, really anytime in your career, but later in your career in my case. And so I don't know what's left. I'm just excited to find out. I mean, in, I've been in this particular position less than two years, and I'm now speaking to audiences I never would have thought of before. I'm uh, thinking about challenges in a new way. My son's getting older, so it changes how I spend my time. I've written a children's book. Maybe there's another book. And so I've gotten a lot more comfortable, Angelina, in the space of I don't know. I don't see it as a negative. I see it as an opening. Yes. What would you like your legacy to be? You know, I, I first and foremost, um, I'd like my legacy to be that I was uh, a great and loving dad. 
Um, and I also would like to be known as somebody who made life better. I mean, I, I really, people can, can find their own way into that, but the people who are uh, my friends, my family, my clients, my colleagues, you know, when my name comes up, I want them to smile and say, oh, that's a good guy. Let me tell you a story about Ben. Let me tell you how he touched my life. How did he make my life better? I mean, I don't mean that to sound uh, presumptuous in any way. I think it's a great goal, right? It's not about money. It's not about title. It's not about achievement. It's certainly not about awards. It's like when, when I came in touch with people and they really got a chance to know me, did I make their life better? And I strive to do that. Not, I don't think about that every day. That would be disingenuous to say that. A lot of days I'm getting through the day like everybody else. But, you know, you make an extra phone call, you return somebody's email. They're looking for the reason why you did it. Is this because they're trying to do this? And like, no, the reason I did it is because it helped. Full stop. Like. And, and I've been on the receiving end a lot of that, too. But life is not a series of transactions. You know, he, 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 the transaction can be I wanted to make your life a little bit better. And it's easier for me to do that with my son because he's 12 and he still listens to me a little bit. But the real challenge is to do it every day, the people that you interact with. And that would be a great legacy. Yeah. Well, I think it's a lovely intention to be clear about the intention and then to execute on it each week. That's brilliant. Yes. So I've spoken on prior podcasts and with clients about the idea of a hardcover coffee table book. How would you like to communicate your legacy? Hmm. You know, I'm, I'm probably going to put that in the category of uh, I don't know dot, dot, dot yet. Um, the joking answer is that the, the book I wrote for young kids is called Big Problems, Little Problems. Um, right now, as I'm going through the challenges of life, and talking to you about uh, all these ways that I help other people, like I'm right in the middle of it too. I'm probably like a lot of the people that you help every day, Angelina. I'm 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 solving problems, and I'm helping others, and I'm also inundated with new things to solve all the time. So I think my hardcover book is is still to be determined, and I'm really excited about what it could be. The joking answer is is that once my son goes to college, it's going to be big problems, not my problem. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm headed for. And I can almost picture that one on the book, except his illustration will be taller and bigger and he'll kind of have his hand out for money and I'll be looking <laughs> the other way. <laughs> but we might need to come back on that one. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's good. Well, at least you can laugh about life's changes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Um, are there any closing thoughts on the topic of legacy that you would like to share? Yeah, I just think that... Uh, the idea of finding what your own story is, is something that uh, I've spent a lot of time thinking about, particularly the last few years. When, when I talk about my work, um, occasionally somebody will ask or wonder, how do the pieces fit together? You know, and, and the story of my life is not that dissimilar to a lot of people's lives. It's not straight, you know, but it's okay to have a messy path. You know, I worked at newspapers and then I found my way onto the national staff of the AP and all of a sudden, I'm, I'm on Air Force One with the president and leading the questioning. And then I stopped, and my boss couldn't believe it, could not believe it. You know, it was like handing back the Willy Wonka golden ticket. I'm like, I'm, I need to do something different. I've done this for 20 years as a journalist, and I went into business, and I've, I've changed, you know, once within that space. And then during the pandemic, I really felt like I wanted to write that book, and I wrote a children's book. But to me, they all fit, because my story is making life better in business and, and at home through language. Like that's the story of my career as I've seen it. And we've talked about it on a personal level, I'm just trying to, to pursue happiness and make life better for, for others and for me. And so I've spent a lot of time trying to find my story and there's gonna be more chapters. And so my closing thoughts for your audience would be to spend some time thinking about like, what is the story that they want while they're still here and shape it? And what's the story that they want? when they're gone. And it just takes that whole legacy conversation and makes it a little bit more, um, less pressurized, more hopeful and, um, and happier. Yes. And more relevant, more relevant. Yeah. More real. Yeah. It's your story. It should be real to you. Yes. Before I read out my closing paragraph, I just would like to take a moment to thank you for being a guest. Uh, we set the intention at the start of this podcast episode to have the listener 
think more about their own story in the context of holistic legacy planning. And I think you've brought up some great key points of thinking about the meaning of words and beginning with goals and and making your life happier, not necessarily um, in today's day and age. You know, everyone talks about the metrics of money, but this these are emotional metrics. This is, this is fulfillment and, you know, the inner wealth. And so I also appreciated the question that you brought up of how am I setting people up or what keeps you up at night and having you drive your legacy compared to circumstances. So I just, before I read out my closing paragraph, thank you for being a guest. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Good, good. So, of course, before I read the closing paragraph, I have to say, we are Penn State. <laughs> okay. All right. In closing, I'm Angelina Carlton, the hostess of the Design Your Legacy podcast, as well as the founder to Legacy Planning, a boutique advisory firm based out of Beverly Hills, California, but international in those I consult. I hope to dive deep into subjects that can help a person to find develop and execute their legacy and continue to scour the landscape for those who can be great resources to every dimension of your legacy. For many listeners, there can never be enough education or preparation in the moot or moat around your castle. Whether you find yourself with new wealth or generational wealth, may the content on this channel be an anchor in any storms ahead. We do our best to provide, to provide original content for your intellectual and emotional curiosity. Thank you so much for joining us today. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please remember to rate and review, share with your family and friends, book a session with either Ben Feller or myself, etc. So thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you, Ben, for speaking into your legacy.